Notre Dame. Wow. Wow. What I love about Andy is we can throw anything at her and she'll have a fascinating story and a great little concert associated with it as well. That's great. I just hope my chorus doesn't go to travel to Austria because we'll always have to learn a piece in the language where we're traveling. <laughs> that would be really tough. <laughs> okay, so we hit, oh, go ahead. It's not singing, there's a glottis and there is a fallacy that you cannot yodel and be a singer. And Werner, who was the second of the Von Trapps, felt very strongly that wasn't true. But one of the granddaughters, one of his grand nieces, Maria went around and actually spoke against yodeling. And so the tradition within the Von Trapps has ended, I believe. But when I found the grandchildren's yodel CD, they did one of the yodels that is written in the book. And it's called Blue Cheese. My mama once gave me some blue cheese to eat. She thought that to me it would be such a treat. But I simply climbed to the top of the house and gave the blue cheese to a mouse, mouse, mouse. And it goes on. But they don't yodel through it. They actually don't yodel through the second part. And that's a three-part yodel instead of hamya, which is a two-part. And the book that I have and the CD that I have um, are two and three part yodel. So if anyone's interested, they can write to me and I will send them both the CD and the book. And I have two people on the list right now who I'm trying to get those off to. But I'm, you want one? You want Randy? You're on my list too. <laughs> um, okay. So um, I love it. I love teaching yodeling. It's, it's a lot of fun. And Werner came up the mountain with us. We would sit, we would go up on the chairlift because the gondola wasn't going yet. We'd go up and you go through the cloud and you'd wear these wool um, sort of over coats. And as you went up, you'd get soaking wet going up through the clouds. And we'd sit up on the mountain in Stowe, Vermont. And we had these great pictures of Werner teaching us on the mountain. And when I was very young, Maria came a number of times. So, but we would yodel up on the mountain. And then if it was completely not possible, we would stay down below in one of the, we would rent out one of the down below um, lodges and we would do a folk dance party on the last day. And Werner would take us outside and we would all yodel outside or we'd sit inside depending on what the weather was. Oh my God, the connections you have are astounding, astounding. Andy, would you write a book about your life? <laughs> I think people would be so interested. When I sat there and I listened to that talk, I was going, can anybody keep track of what I'm talking about? I mean, my brain goes off in so many different, it is such, it's a web. It's, it's, um, Savila Sabela Loza. It's the way the grapevine grows. It's not in a, in a straight line though. I, and, and Sally Martin used to sit, we'd sit there and talk and I could go off in 18 different directions and just lose track. And Sally kept track of it all though. <laughs> all right, so, so we do have some questions for some people, so let's go to that. So first of all, um, who did Andor teach with at Stockton? This is Ricky who? Oh, um, Ricky Holden, is that correct? It is Holden, not Holder, and that's the other thing I do is script. Mm -hmm. Who always taught at Stockton, he did all the, um, he did the squares, and I think I was there the last year that he taught there, the year that he retired. That was the year that I taught at Stockton. And Andor loved his books and loved his work. And Ricky Holden is, uh, there's Ricky Holden and Ricky Holder. And they were both two different people. One was in New Hampshire and the other one was in Stockton. And they were both contra dance and square dance. But Ricky up here was a friend who my mother worked with in the schools and she taught in the schools. So Ricky and Ricky were both yeah, Contra and Squares. But um, Andor loved the uh, records, and he took those and he used them. And he was at, and I know, I finally got this down. He was the faculty at the State University of New York and uh, College of Cortland, 25 years. He and Anne were together, and he retired after 25 years as a professor emeritus and moved down to Virginia where he was an adjunct professor of kinesi kinesiology and dance at the College of William and Mary. 
took me long enough to get that one right. Right. So in terms of kinesthesiology, I thought it's the first time I've ever said that, um, you were in your, in your present, in your interview, talked about um, the connection with the uh, PE, with phys ed. And it, what I kind of thought about is that a lot of the European choreographers slash teachers have told us that that's really been their connection, their degrees are in PE. And right. much more, I think much more so than, than the Americans. Uh, there's, a, there's a stronger connection, but you taught me that there really is a strong connection between PE and folk dance here too. Yes, and my mother was a dance, she was a PE teacher with a dance focus and concentration. And that is the degree my older sister, Mickey, got from UMass Amherst, but that was because they didn't have a degree yet. But by the time I graduated four years later, they had a degree, so I got my BFA in dance. But I would have also had a PE degree with dance concentration if they didn't get one. Um, who who Andor taught with? Um, no, no. A A Aline and Charles does conf did confirm that it was Holden. Okay. Um, no, but the other question was who did he teach with? And at different camps, he would teach. He would find a, a good female teacher that he would teach with. And I know he taught with Sandy Wodek at one camp and Molly was a woman who had gone and danced with Shandor Timar, and that was after she had danced with Andor and assisted him in teaching, but he never brought anybody with him. He would teach with someone who was there at the camp. And so it was different people at different places that he went. So there was never a particular teacher that he taught with. Anne only did that for two or three times, but that she went off and did her own work. Andy, can you tell us a little about the quilt behind you? Ah, the quilt was a quilt that was made for my dad for his 80th birthday. And in this quilt, it has, it's one of the first quilts you could do a print of a picture and put it on it. So this was um, Gretel Dunsing and her husband, who were teachers. And then, of course, Dick Crum is in the center. And there's my dad. And this was a picture of Nelda Drury when she was dancing younger. And this is a person, I always mess up his name, is David. He worked for the United States government. And what he was doing was um, translating. Um, he would go in and say, if you're going to go to this country, you don't do these things. These will be insults. So what you do are these things. And these are the correct ways of acting. And these are the correct way of doing and I can't remember his name, and somebody there is going to remember the name. I'm sure somebody's going to type it in for me. But David Rosenberg, is that right? David Rosenberg. And so he was very instrumental in some of the um, filming of the early teachers. And a lot of his work has ended up at the Library of Congress. But you can't get to those unless you have money and a grant to get in and see it. So much of his work is locked away, and people cannot get to it. But it is available. Um, and that's David and Andor and Ralph Page. Of course, Ralph Page is uh, contradancing in New Hampshire. He was one of the first contradance callers that came down and started teaching in the Boston area. So my aunt was dancing with Ralph in the 30s and Dick Best in the 30s in the Boston area. Um, Ada Jivanovska, so many people knew her as the she was the one who um, was the artistic director of um, Krakowiak dancers here in Boston. And they went to Poland on a yearly basis and would win awards at the Polish traditional dance festival. She's 104, and on her 104th birthday, I got a video from her son, Yash, because I grew up with Yash and Basha, uh, her kids, and um, I got a video of her and Yash doing um, Adas Kuyavyak at 104. She is still up and moving well. Um, Yanis Papas, uh, John Pappas, who lives in California, is still an amazing musician. He and his wife, Paula, live in California, and I love them dearly. Um, and he's still around. This is Madeline Green, whose uh, Portuguese collection and all those important things were things that were so important to my mother. Uh, Yves Moreau, who many of you will recognize, and Germaine and Louise Hebert, 
who were the French teachers, and they still live in Canada. And then down on this corner, I'm not sure who that is. And then Glenn Bannerman. Many of you know Glenn. And Andor and Glenn and David Vinsky were, and uh, um, was Ralph there? I think we're all at my wedding when I got married at Oktoberfest in 1987. Um, and Glenn is just wonderful, and he still runs his camp. I love this man. He's just, he's absolutely one of the biggest huggable bears you could ever want. And then Nelda Drury, of course, uh, is here. And then this is just um, Elton, uh, John Elton Floyd um, was a dear friend, and he was a folk dance contra and somebody who is very, very important to my mother and father's lives. And then my mom... Always got to have her hanging around. Um, but that's, the, the quilt is all, it was for my dad's 80th birthday. And it was given by a friend. Now you mentioned one of your sisters getting a degree in dance. And clearly you've got the best dancing genes in America. So what about your other siblings? They, you know, they must have connections to dance. They do. My younger sister, Tina, decided that what, well, okay, older sister, Mickey, director of dance at Boston University's Phys Ed Recreation and Dance Department. She had taken that department, which was a teeny little peanut, and grew it into a massive something. And she got it to the point where she was part of the development of their black box theater. She is massively invested in the university and has run the um, college dance group for years. And she is the person who my mother gave all of the organizational genes to. Uh, she walked off with everything. Uh, the ability to tell a story, the ability to organize a paper, the ability to do, she just looks at me and goes, okay. <laughs> Don't know what you were talking about, Andy, but that's okay. Um, and she tells me I always remember stories wrong. Um, but that's because she's got this brain that everything gets really computerized. She is amazing. Choreographer, uh, she teaches, she's wonderful with her students, she does dance history, um, just an amazing brain um, and a wonderful human being. That's my sister, Mickey Taylor Penny. And then younger sister, Tina, decided she was gonna be a stay-at-home mom and her kids are part of my Mlados group and she comes in and dances with me, which is so much fun. And when I was down, uh, doing a dance residency, she came to see it and started talking to one of the choreographers. And the choreographer said to me later, you know what your sister said to me? She said, I thought I was being a rebellious teenager and I decided not to dance. And she says, I so regret that now. But so she's been dancing with me with her kids. And Tina McBride is an amazing, she is a great dancer. She's a great mom. And she's she dances with me. I get to dance with her every other week, except for that she busted her ankle recently, so now I can't dance with her at all. But that's okay. She'll get back. She already busted the same ankle, plate, pins, <laughs> really bad. And brother, our baby brother, who is six foot two, has been a teacher of sixth grade, mostly science, has taught just about everything. And he has been the coach of the basketball and the girls' volleyball teams. After having four older sisters, I wonder why he's so good with girls. Um, but he teaches science, and they give him all the hardest kids in the school, and he's great with the kids. And he danced, I think, until the day that he brought his swords to school and danced in his kilt for his class in fourth grade and then was playing soccer in the afternoon and slammed his head into the wall because his feet got tangled up in the soccer ball or something. Um, he didn't dance much after fifth grade, but I can still drag him on the dance floor, and he's still an amazing humbler. He still, and he went to the Highland Balls with my mom and I, so we dragged him to a bunch of Highland um, Balls, because he still does Scottish dancing, but he hasn't actually gone to dances in a number of years. I think the Highland Ball was the last thing that we were able to drag him to. So, of course, everybody's you know, just about everybody's saying, I, I knew both of your parents, especially Marianne. I'll, I'll, I'll give you those in a minute. But since you mentioned Mulados, 
Aline and Charles in Rochester. No, Arlene and Chuck. It's different. Oh, excuse me. There's, a, there's an <laughs> I mean, Arlene and Charles and Arlene and Chuck. That's funny. Okay, so um, so they so uh, they're asking um, what current projects are you working on, and can you talk about Mlados going to Romania uh, to participate in the festival there? Yeah. <laughs> So we were, er, we were raising all this money. Mladost, I founded the group when my father passed away because I wanted to be able to do demonstrations of the dance that he loved, but we actually had stopped doing a lot of the harder folk dances. So I got together my son and daughter and then some other local dancers. Catherine Pixton is Tom and Barbara Pixton's daughter and Jeremy Van Cleve is Marcy Van Cleve's son. And there were a bunch of other kids, and I got them together, and we rehearsed for my father's celebration. And they did um, Genshi Verbonk, they did um, Kreuzkönig, and a few other fun dances. Um, and then they said, well, we can't stop now. We have to keep going. We're not going to let you stop. And so one of the dancers was a young, uh, tall man who was discovering his Croatian roots. And so... He and the group got together and they decided on the name Mlados Folk Ensemble because Mlados in many Balkan languages means youth. And so Sam Zegas was the one who came up with the name of um, Mlados Folk Ensemble. And the group has been going since my father's passing and we celebrated my mother's celebration and we danced for the dance for my Aunt Angela when she passed away three years ago. But they have continued, and that group has changed. Every time someone graduates from high school, they go off, and I get new dancers, and the folk dance community, when kids finally get dancing, and the ages run, the youngest they've joined is nine, and Kasha is an amazing singer, and who her two children are dancing with us. And right now, there are two ex-Mandala musician and person, and their daughters are with us. So we end up with a lot of children who are coming through with parents, but also parents who had no dance background. Mlados was going to Romania. We were invited to go to the Children's Festival in Batradorne, and COVID happened. And so we didn't get to go this year but we've been having outdoor rehearsals. So we get them outside in their own yarned off boxes on the ground and I play the music and they learn dances and we sit on, a, on this big outdoor thing and we yodel together. So we're hoping to get them yodeling and getting them to do something for Oktoberfest weekend. We're gonna try and do a, a half a day thing where everyone can see what Mladost is doing and we don't know if we're going next year. We have not been invited formally, but they also don't know what's happening next year. Nobody knows what's happening. So in the meanwhile, we are not putting the time to waste. The kids are dancing, the kids are yodeling, the kids are singing. We've been working on singing Croatian and Bulgarian, and I'm starting to teach them a Hungarian song, so they're learning all these different singing uh, languages and songs they can dance to. So they continue to learn and we continue to work. And I want people who have their kids in the area to come send me more children. And when I say children, I have to refer to that loosely because my eldest member is 40, but she looks like she's 22. And yeah, I know she's little, she's petite, she's a peanut and she's a wonderful, you know, leg springs for legs and that kind of thing. Some of you met Laura de Cesare, um, when she went to San Antonio, she has been on a number of the, she teaches. So on Tuesday nights, the Tuesday night community dance, everyone is welcome. I would love to have you come to the dance. Please just write to me in my email, A-T-A-Y dance at gmail.com. And hopefully you, if you want me to, I'll put it in the chat, but A-T-A-Y at G, uh, ate dance at gmail.com and you can also look at my website which is andytaylordance.com and there's a connection there on my website to the Tuesday community dance so 
please come dancing with us. We had Joe Graciosi, we've got Paul Collins, we had Tom Roby, we had Tom and Cherie Bazigian come and teach. And it's a beginner to intermediate level. So we do a hard teach at the beginning from 7 to 7.30, and then we dance at 9 o'clock. And then people have been asking me about my stretches. No, it has been 10 years since someone told me to start a YouTube channel. I still have not started my YouTube channel. But if you come to the dance on Tuesday nights, we stretch at the end of the dance every week. So come stretch with me. Um, and yes, I'm going to get my YouTube channel up, I promise. I'm doing it. You would think over this last summer I would have gotten... No, I haven't done it yet. That's because my brain does that. So, so um, under a normal, in a normal year, what are the classes that you've had that you that you teach? I teach modern fifty five plus. I never check credentials. You're welcome to come and take a basic, basic modern strengthening ballet, not ballet, balance, and um, a modern class. That's Monday and Wednesday mornings. And then on uh, Tuesday nights is the um, the Tuesday night community dance. On Thursday night, I teach a modern jazz class at an intermediate level. But Sunday morning is a two and a half hour floor warming and then modern jazz class. And then I normally would be ringleader for the Royal Scottish Country Dance Society's Boston Scottish Country Dancers. We're the demo team for Boston. I teach at Wheaton College for the um, Wheaton College Dance Company, and I run Blados, and I run a company called the Back Pocket Dancers, and you can find backpocketdancers.com. We're an intergenerational company, and we tell stories from all over the world, and I use my dance to add to the stories, and we do it through narration and movement and words, and that's an amazing, wonderful company as well. We're working on another piece we're doing we had an outdoor rehearsal the other day that was really exciting. And we got to dance outside on grass. And and that's another wonderful company. The eldest is 82 and the youngest is 26. So um, that company is also going. So I'm artistic director to four companies. And then I'm teaching on top of that. I was informed the other day that um, I, I do a lot. <laughs> so I think that answers the question that uh, that uh, Arlene had, which was, uh, you know, are you work, you know, what what projects, what new projects are you are you working on? Do you have anything planned for the future? Going to get my YouTube channel up. I am going to do that, and I want to start doing dancing basics for um, school kids, and not just teaching the dances, but what is a kerplunk, what is a bloop bloop. And what is a mixed pickles? And um, I think that it's important that people realize that, yeah, there's this great book that Anne Sampo did. And it's called Recreational Dance, right? And you can't buy it anywhere. But in it is a whole thing on vocabulary. And the vocabulary, um, it talks about basic locomotive movements and all of this stuff, movement positions, and it's everything that Anne was able to write. And I used that for when I was teaching my international folk dance class at Tufts University, which has now stopped. Um, so, I mean, I would love to teach at a university. I teach um, one-time classes, which is why my, my living went down the tubes, because as a teaching artist, you can't do residencies in schools. So all of my school residencies went poof. And I had a student who pushed me to teach online. And she got me connected to Zoom. So I have been Zooming my modern, my modern jazz, my folk dance. And I'm teaching a couple of different things for the um, North Virginia Scottish dance uh, I'm doing a thing with them for a day, uh, one night, and it's going to be on what exercises should we be doing so that when we get back to dancing, we actually have muscles left. We haven't just atrophied into nothing because walking does not build Scottish dance muscles, right? And that's what we have to do is keep our Scottish dance muscles going. And 
there's also um, it's focus on form, which is going to be for the Boston Scottish Country Dance Society. So I'm doing one night things. Most of these are not paid gigs. It's just because I want people to keep dancing. I really want people to keep moving, and that's why I love teaching the folk dancing online because keeping people connected to each other and letting them know that we're still out there. I have people from Hawaii and Colorado and California and Illinois and Canada that come to the class and just knowing that we're still all very connected and that this pandemic will never stop international folk dancing and we need to keep our muscles we need to keep our connecting muscles and our dancing muscles and our counting muscles and I'm also trying to get as many college kids in so the University of Massachusetts Lowell I've been working with them to keep their dance group going even though clubs are not allowed to meet we've been keeping going online so keeping college kids coming in to dance is I'm trying to get beginners how do you get college kids to do something physical in their college rooms and how do you get them to go into spaces right um, I'm teaching Wheaton over zoom I'm on zoom they're in a room 10 feet apart in six by five rectangles I mean dance is now all reimagined so it's really interesting I'm starting to teach in person classes but we have to stay far apart and we need to take keep the masks on don't let people walk down the street with their mask below their nose don't do that keep it up over your nose realize that masks are part of our lives and that if we want to keep dancing going and not make dance the cause of spikes then we need to be really smart about it so that's that's a heartfelt plea and it's so important that we keep everybody safe and keep them breathing and keep them moving so that's really what my my thing for this year get my YouTube teach my little short things get dances online things that schools can use um, kids in classrooms I mean we have no idea what it's gonna look like so so I think uh, I think you answered Serena's question she said are your are your um, modern dance classes online are all of your classes listed on your website yes my zoom classes are listed you have to write to me through email and then I send you the link because I can't just let it go we've been bombed once right, I understand but but at least in terms of what uh, when they occur and what they are people can find out and then if they're interested we've given everybody here that your your email address yes you can get the get the link that way yes absolutely um, so it's been fun seeing folk dancers come to my modern classes it's been great uh, yeah, so I mentioned earlier that people have been sending these comments of saying, you know, how I, you know, loved your mother and I knew your, both your parents. I'll, I'll just quote one, Ruth Hyde in, in Rochester said, she knew both of your parents, uh, especially your mom, and loved dancing with her. She started, uh, Ruth started dancing in Buffalo in 1959, yeah. very close to that beginning time period with your mom. Uh, Andra came to Rochester many, many times, and she said, I was with your mom at Pine Woods, of course, and also love the round pound, the round, oh. the, I'm sorry, the round, round pond, round pond. I didn't know that I was going to be given tongue twisters to say here. <laughs> I still sing in the morning at round pond. My mother used to be out there and she'd wake up people on round pond by singing to them. And I still get out there. And this year it was canceled, of course, but 6.30 a.m. That's swimming either in the rain or not. It's beautiful. It's absolutely magical. Well, if you do some yodeling, you'll wake up some people in the neighborhood. Yeah, I didn't yodel in the, in the pond. I, I didn't do that first thing in the morning. I did use that as an auction item. They used, uh, do you want someone woken up early in the morning for yodeling? And then they started selling insurance that it wouldn't be done to the cabin nearby. They made a lot of money that way. <laughs> it's like selling Gaida, you know, or, or yeah, or, exactly. or Zerna, Zerna wake-up calls, yes. Well, I can't tell you how much I have loved listening to this again, and you're, I'm not the only one. Several of the people that were online today saw the original, the original interview during the stock week of Stockton, July 11th through 18th, and they wanted to hear you again. Thank you. Um, Thank and I can, I'll tell everybody that if you want to get these materials, 
by all means make a contribution to Stockton. You can get the Stockton package. Um, let me just do a quick share just here real set real quickly. Um, and don't forget next Monday uh, is uh, Richard Powers with uh, the history of the can can. It's really a, an amazing, amazing presentation. But I don't know how I can find the words. Andy, you have such expressiveness, such enthusiasm, such sparkle, and you're such an entertaining and engaging speaker. Uh, we could listen to you for 24 hours, and uh, I'm sure that you would still. And she can talk for 24 and hours. And she could come up Absolutely. with a talk for 24 Absolutely. hours. Absolutely. And, and not repeat anything. And not repeat anything. And I hope to see you in person if there's a NEFA next to you. That's yeah. what we always would need. Yes, his NEFA is great. Um, there is the um, San Antonio Folk Dance Festival That's this nice. week, Saturday, and I'll be speaking at 8.35, and then I'm leading some dances um, until, I think, 9 o'clock. So that's that's fun. Uh, so Ruth typed, as she gave another chat, she says she made a typo. It wasn't 1959. She started dancing in 1950. <laughs> so, uh, and you mentioned, you mentioned several people in their hundreds. Um, I don't know. You know, it's not scientifically possible to run the experiment, but it could be that we've got a lot of people who are aged and still healthy and still dancing because their genes were good and they're, they are attracted to dance because they are going to be good. Or it could be the other way around, which is because you dance, you're going to continue to be in health and have lots of uh, agility and the ability to learn new dances. Uh, in our own group, we've had five or six people in their late 90s oh, yeah. still dancing yes and uh we are very lucky and many groups around the world have just are just as lucky it's just it's just a wonderful thing to experience but you're right we need the college kids we do we really do and going to florida when i taught with andor there was you know the over 90 group it was great seeing how many people were over 90 and i still love the people who I, I met in Florida and people who were the older dancers. And there are so many who I love the fact that folk dancing not only staves off the aging process and it staves off dementia, but I've met three or four people who actually had late diagnosis of Parkinson's because dance actually made it so that they weren't diagnosed early because they didn't show the signs, the physical signs, and they didn't present. So there's no question that dance does a wonderful job of, of course, keeping the brain cells going, but um, it also helps to stave off a lot of those things that people don't realize how important, they're getting scientific proof now, like we needed proof, right? We didn't need the proof, but dancers have known for generations that dance is something that helps you to stave off the Parkinson's and the dementia and the Alzheimer's. But drinking water while you're dancing and not getting dehydrated is even more important on top of that. So I will emphasize the water with the dancing. Okay, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask everybody to unmute, but until I, before I do, I wanna give a big applause because it's not gonna come through well on, uh, on Zoom. We love you, but everybody can unmute now. And uh, I'm going to take the spotlight off of me, cancel the spotlight. So we've got Andy. So you should be all be able to unmute and say hi. Hi, Andy. Hi. 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 <laughs> Wonderful. Buddy. Hi. Very nice to see you guys. <laughs> it's amazing. Thank it is amazing. You were, you were better the second time around. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, Kathy. Hey, Andy. How are you doing, honey? Good, good. I just now got in. Uh, I missed it. Um, oh. Arlene, Roberta, good to see you. I see you every Tuesday. I love it. Very nice to see you. J-H-W stands for whom? J-H-W oh. stands for whom? John I'll Wilson. Who is it? John Wilson. He's with a Morristown group. Got it, John Wilson, yeah. and I love it. Uh, Aline and Arlene are right above each other with Chuck and Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi, good to see you, Sarina, hello. Hi. Hi. 
Serena, I haven't seen you. Good to see you, Paul. And I see Lisa and Karen. Janet Baker from Newton. Hi. Oh, hi, hi, Janet. Janet. Hi, Janet. You did a great job. Hi, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. I wonder. Boy, do I wonder when I talk. I just sort of kind of go all over the map. I can't keep going. Karen Bartholomew. Hi. Hi. Do I know you? No. You look. <laughs> you do now. That lived in. <laughs> I've gone to Maine Woods, but I don't. You you don't go to Maine Woods, right? I went to Maine Folk Dance Camp. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not invited me to Maine Woods. Maybe you can make a difference in that. So I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, where today the sun did not shine. Oh. They're covered with smoke. Of course. But it didn't yeah. smell smoky. It's been a very bizarre day. Um, and then I spent summers in Maine, so I started going to Maine Woods. Anyway, I love folk dancing. I did it as a child, like you. Yes, definitely. It's the, I think in the I'm, 50s, I was dancing in the 50s. Yeah. yeah. Not, well, I got, I didn't, well, I was dancing in utero in the 50s. Yeah. Okay, I'm older than you. <laughs> anyway, it was lovely. Uh, Thank you for hearing your talk. Thank you. And Lisa, really good to see you too, Lisa Rufo. Yes, thanks. I just got unmuted. I wrote a note to uh, Murray. So thank you for unmuting. Excellent. So Excellent. nice to see you, Andy. Thank you. Good to see you too. Bob Parr, Arlington what? Arlington, Mass, Virginia, what? Where are you? Massachusetts. Oh, hi. I probably know you and don't know it. <laughs> you probably do. I danced with, uh, with Bob in, 19, in, in, you know, when I was up at MIT, at MIT dancing in the late 70s and early 80s. Then we very possibly have met before. <laughs> and I know that your name is not Dank on Visor. Hi. Hi, I just want to say I enjoyed your presentation so much and you were so animated and I was going to be doing something else here to <laughs> tear myself away and I'm one who started dancing in the 1950s also and still attempting to to some extent. And you know what? It's not an attempt. You are still dancing. Remember on every dance floor there are multiple levels and those that are dancing the longest have to prove nothing but just fill themselves <laughs> being there. And well, Elizabeth te still teaches a group and she's fabulous. You're amazing. If you're still running a group, that you're doing more than just trying. I was, I was running it until COVID, but I don't think I'm going to go back to it at no. all. Oh, it is a bit anyway, going will help somebody, I am sure. And we'll also put a plug in for Elizabeth because she ran dance weekends, much like the ones that you were talking about for your family. Right. And, uh, they were very, very fine. The, the, one, the one thing I loved about Elizabeth is she knew and taught dances that I didn't find anyone else knew. And so I always learned some really unique stuff from Elizabeth. Wow. Wow. Thank you. There are a number of dances that are missing and old and have been forgotten, and I need someone to help me see if we can find them. Do you know any of the Hotas? I don't know. Elizabeth, do you know any of the Hotas? Oh, oh sorry. I didn't know you were still talking to me. Uh, no, I don't think so, but I did want to say I'm not Dan. That's my son. Oh. <laughs> That's how this happened to be, and I'm pretty illiterate when it comes to changing these things so it just oh don't worry about it as long as we know you're elizabeth it's not a worry <laughs> so you mentioned the san antonio uh group yes. they are this weekend i want to tell everybody i hope you all know they're having a big festival uh kathy mulga is is uh, coordinating along with the other people in her team and so saturday night after a dance workshop with mihai if you go to san antonio and just look up folk dance in san antonio you'll find their festival site Right. Just, just have to click click on a little thing that says register. You enter your email address, and immediately you get the link. And uh, we're going to dance all night. She, Kathy, had this wonderful idea to invite leaders from all across the continent. And so, from uh, I don't know, I, I think we have people in you have people in Canada too. So from the east coast all the way to the west coast. Yes, that is what I'm looking forward to. 
and it's also you'll see Jimmy and Lizzie there, Nelda's kids. Oh. They'll be there also. Um, hey, Kathy, I'm really glad you're doing this. Regina Feldman, hello. I remember, and I'm trying to think of where it was that we met. Oh, really? Where was it? Because I know you. Maine Woods, maybe. I don't know. Well, not Maine Woods, but probably somewhere else. All right. Yeah. Good to see you. And I see Lenny's iPad, but the person has left, and she looked familiar, too. Well, I loved your talk. I thought it was beautiful. I just wonderful. Yeah. Thank Andy. you, Andy. I, I used to study modern with, um, I studied Graham from, like, age 18 to 20 to 30 or so. That's um, great. And yeah. I, I actually had it in high school every day. I have people coming into my class that have decided that since they've hit their 60s, they want to get back and do some more moving. <laughs> and they come back into my classes. And it's yeah. cool watching people start. Someone said to me at one point, so I'm 42, and, I, and I, well, I'm 58 at the time. <clears throat> and she said, do you think I'm too old to start dancing? And I went, no. <laughs> right. I'm saying, what are you talking about? But anyone who thinks they're too old to start dancing, they are very much mistaken. And I really believe seriously that if you have danced at any point in time, your body will kick in and surprise, your, surprise you. It's wonderful the way that these things remain. Your kinesthetic brain mm. is interrupted when you get past 18. Your gray matter gets in the way. But if you go back into moving again, your kinesthetic brain takes over. And it really does kick back in again. Um, even habits. I've gotten a few people that I, <laughs> I, I... One person said, you know, you're giving me all the corrections that my teacher used to give me in high school. And I said, hmm, well, let's look at that. I wonder why. <laughs> right. Well, I never stopped. I, I went from, from Graham to Weidman to to folk dance from 1960s with Sonny Newman what? to uh, Columbia That's to crazy. ballroom, competitive. Wow. To, I mean, I just kept, you know, going from one form to another, to Latin, to swing. That's great. And back to folk dance. So what, Can I, I say something more? I yeah. Just, yeah. I just wanted to say, you're, if you think you're too old, you're the youngest now that you will ever be. So don't wait. That's, <laughs> that's true. Very good. And I, now, um, terrific. I, yes. I also want to say that I remember dancing with Nelda Drury's son, and Nelda, of course, but with her son at Maine Folk Dance Camp. And I remember the dance that he taught was, it's a lot of solo dance. People call it a line dance. I call it a solo dance. All my exes live in Texas. That's why I reside in whatever it was, Tennessee or something. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fun um, solo dance that he bought. You know, you know, can I say something, Andy? Are we going to now or during dinner? Well, we were going to scratch. Gina? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I want to say, um, Andy, are you there? I'm right here, hon. Yeah, I remember and being in a workshop a couple of times with Andor. Yes. And I remember the group trying to imitate his style. Yes. And I'm saying, we cannot do this. We have to be born Hungarian. <laughs> he has a style that's so... I'm coming, dear. To be born with. <laughs> yes, you're right. Andor so so when you said that today in your speak talk, yes. I understood perfectly what he meant when he said, people can't do this here. <laughs> <laughs> It was really... <laughs> what he often said was, if you're finding a dance that doesn't feel right on your body, it's not that it's the wrong dance, and it's not that you're the wrong person, it's just that they don't belong together. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is not so easy to learn, to copy what he's doing, to imitate him even. And he didn't want people to imitate him exactly, but he really wanted people to... Feel it. Feel it and play with the music and internalize it. Yeah. But it, that internalization is so important in the music and in the dance. And that was it. It was don't try to imitate, internalize. 
just try to feel what he's but doing. But I have to, I have to go on Sunday. Uh, uh, the coach is leaving to California. So really internalization of the music and internal. And, you know, the other night, Joe Graciosi was teaching the rhythms, the Greek rhythms, hearing them in the music. And I said to him, did I miss that in the middle of that? And he goes, no, no, no. They just changed from in the nine... They just changed from emphasizing five and four to emphasizing three and something and something. And I went, oh, so I didn't screw up. It's just the, the time signature just sort of kind of went elsewhere, but then it came back. And he says, yeah, you just have to keep that metronome going in your head. And I just telling my own students, keep the metronome going. Ignore the lag in the music. Ignore the lag in the television, because on Zoom, there is always a lag. And I'm always telling people, keep the metronome going. Keep it going in your head. Find your metronome. Don't always look at the screen. You can look at the screen for the steps, but find the music. And I just went, oh, that's what I need to do for myself in the Greek dancing. Keep that metronome going. And I, I always learn more. I always learn for people when I take classes. And I love that fact that I haven't stopped learning and that I keep finding new ways of looking at things. It's internalization. Absolutely right. Yeah. So one of the things that you mentioned was that you are uh, doing classes and hoping to get into the into the colleges. And so Roberta, uh, one of the, one of the things that she typed just a little while ago was, "What advice do you have for encouraging college kids to get involved with dance?" Um, I taught a class at Tufts University, and it was called Salsa to Sardanas. I taught them the Catalonian Sardanas. And the traditional Sardana is a math equation. So what I try to do is I try to tell people who love world music, and then I try to get people who are interested in math and computer, because those are the people who really love folk dancing. Right. Right. And my class was small. And I said, we've got two weeks, guys. We need more people in the class. So what I want you to do is go find in your math classes, the most introverted people. <laughs> I want you to find people who are not good at small talk. People who are not good at conversation. Because one of the things about folk dancing is you walk in, you take hands, you can say, hi, my name is, and then the conversation is written on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> and this is something for a lot of introverts who want to be social who want to get out and do something physical, but they're not into competitive sports. They're not into competitive ballroom. They w don't want it to be that exacting. They just want to get out. And the people who say, I've got two left feet, are the people who work the hardest and stay the longest. Hmm. And so I had them all go out and find the introverted people in their classes and bring them to class. And I said, okay, we're not talking today. We're just walking in. We walk in and we did the beginning warm-up, which was the introduction to the steps that I was going to use in the dances of the day. And then I taught the dances, told them where they were from, how I had learned them. They did not have to talk. And then at the end of the class, I had them write an intake form. What relationship have you had to dance in your life? And I told them my background. And they wrote this out. And then at the end of the class, they all went, I didn't realize how much dance was in my life. Mm -hmm. So you bring them into understanding. You don't have to have the small talk. It is math and it's fun. There is a vocabulary to it, but it's not one that has to come out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. And then just holding hands and learning by connecting to somebody else. There's so much in that. People do it online and students do it online. The students that I've had that are college kids are computer people, introverts, and world music people. And those are the things that I want people to know, that these are the people who really actually want to take part in the dance, but they don't know it. And just trying to bring them in and let them see what it is, let them know that folk dancing is one of the most forgiving things you make a million mistakes and the dance keeps going and it's repetitive and you get better at it and those patterns start settling into your kinesthetic brain. Your synapse all start the computization of all of those things and as time goes on it becomes easier. 
and it becomes easier and you build a repertoire and it's it's not as it's not as hard as so many people believe that it is because I can't tell you the number of music teachers who have told my students that they should just lip sync and what I tell them is <laughs> singing is what just what the person next to you wasn't singing that's all um, and you just keep trying and they eventually start to hear it and it just takes time I don't hush people when they try to sing while they're dancing I tell them to sing while they're dancing I make sure that they understand that singing it helps it go through the body it helps you to channel the music sing while you're dancing talk to yourself while you're dancing and you don't have to have conversation with somebody else. It's all written on the floor. Join hands. You can be a total introvert in folk dancing. And these are all points that are so important for college kids to know. Folk dancing is forgiving. Make a million mistakes, keep coming back, you'll figure it out. And folk dancing is very forgiving. So we just, we're not forgiving of ourselves. That's the thing, it's really hard. But those are all things that I run on when I'm teaching my college kids. And I had a lot of college kids who didn't know that dance was macho. And then I started telling them about I, I really, martial arts. What do you think? They, they call them katas, where you, you learn this sequence of movement, which eventually moves into some, it's just dance in your head. It's just dance. It's all dance. It's how they taught warriors. It's how they taught hunters. It is macho. It is the beginning language of the, of the human being. And they loved the fact that they didn't know that all these cultures existed. I was in the bank today talking to a kid who does Latin dance. He had no idea that the guy next door to him who was his new boss was Croatian and had been dancing for years and the two of them started talking music. I mean, it gave them a total new connection that was not just banking. And it was because I started playing rapper sword on my thing and had them going, oh my God, there's something they do with metal swords that bends? What is that? And it's done to Celtic music? And yeah, you open up whole worlds and whole lines of conversation through music and dance. And that's, you know, you find the thing that's going to draw them in. That's the thing that's most important. Mom talked about getting on the train going to Portugal. Every car had five Turks all wanting the woman to come in. They all wanted the single lady to come join them in the car. And she said, I found a family that had five and they were Albanians. And so she went in, they couldn't speak to each other. So she started singing Albanian tunes that they danced to and they all knew it and they ended up <laughs> in this little tiny car these Albanian dances couldn't speak any of their the same language but they all sang the same tunes and they danced in this little tiny car on the train and that was how she communicated so music is communication dance is communication thank you absolutely awesome let's everybody give an applause Thank you everybody it's wonderful to see you all and it's wonderful to see you and I, I seem like I remember faces but that's just me thank you very much Paul Olson nice to see you thank you thank you Serena take good care and come back to dancing <laughs> yes and Vibeka good to have you here too uh, hi <laughs> I decided not to have a picture on tonight, but I enjoyed it immensely. And I started folk dancing when I was 68, Mary. Wonderful. <laughs> now I'm 20 years older. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> One of my dear friends was T Stella Penzar. And she and her husband, uh, after World War II, came into Boston and started dancing. But they didn't start dancing until 1970. No, 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 it was 1960 something. And I danced with her every Copley Square she could possibly dance at. Yes. Passed away at 96 years old. But I needed dancers, elder dancers, for a, a mm -hmm. dance 
were doing with uh, the company Prometheus Dance Company. It was called Apocalypsis, and it was about refugees. And they wanted elder dancers. And I said, Stella, come dance with us. And she was 86 years old at the time. And she comes in, and she could pick everything up. And she amazed them. They were absolutely blown away by this woman. And she went into the schools with her husband, who had lived through two of the death camps as a dentist. He, was, he had the names burned into his, the numbers burned into his skin. And they went around to all the schools and talked about the Holocaust. And she had made it out of the uh, Warsaw Ghetto the night before they cleared it. Her father had gotten her Christian papers. She lost her entire family. They were librarians in the Warsaw Ghetto. And her entire family was annihilated. And she came to Boston, was dancing in Boston, and we brought her into this dance. And so one day, our director said, Stella, sing us a song, something that brings to you refugees, and we're going to do this movement. And she watched the movement going across the stage. Young conservatory dancers, Prometheus uh, company members like myself, and the Prometheus elders, who all had to be over 55 to be part of the company. And we were doing this action that he was telling us to do. She and people got halfway across. She went, stop, stop. You have to go back. I have another song. I have to sing this song. Everybody in a very thick <laughs> pole. She was wonderful. And so they started going across and she started singing. And everybody was absolutely taken in. And by the time everybody got across the stage and she had finished, everyone was in tears. And no one knew, except for one woman in the room, knew what she was singing. And in the performance, she ended up singing this with a young girl standing, um, holding an umbrella over her head as these people went through across the stage. Uh, something that they do to find bombs if you're running through minefields is you roll a rock in front of you. And if it doesn't blow up, you live. But the person in front was killed. And so we were doing this, and there was mist on the stage. We had upside down birch trees and she was singing this and everybody would come out at the end and go, why are we crying? What is she singing? In the refugee camps, there was a song that was written by a man who was a Jewish refugee. They wouldn't kill him during World War II, but stuck him away in a prison. And he wrote this poem. It was snuck out. It was written and it's only sung in the Orthodox and Hasidic uh, temples when they celebrate the um, Holocaust. When Stella got to the United States and she met her husband and they got married, she never went back to temple again because she didn't believe that there could be a God that existed that allowed those horrors. But she was at every peace rally you could possibly go to in <laughs> all the schools, right? She was singing this song and she said we would sing it and hit our forks on the tables waiting for the day that we would be free. And none of us knew what it was, but it wrenched our hearts and she had everybody in total silence and she blew the audience away for three weeks of performances <laughs> the most amazing woman and yep. it's such life in her but she was brought from the folk dance world into the contemporary dance world and she was just an amazing woman and she died at 96 up in vermont but <laughs> she sent us a video of her getting out of her wheelchair about four months before she passed away and they were playing jazz music and she had gotten out of her wheelchair and just started dancing <laughs> um, dance keeps you going Janet you know who I'm talking about I, I certainly do and I had the um, privilege um, of giving Stella many rides to the MIT folk dancing basically for years right. because she, she lived in Newton as I do and she would regale me with stories coming and going to MIT every Sunday night. And some of them were just stunning. And she would sing me songs in different languages. And um, it was quite an education and, and an honor. She was an amazing woman. There was a book on in Newton. And I was driving home. She was two blocks from home. And she's walking through the snow, shuffling. The snow is up to her shins. And I insist on picking her up. No, no, no. I only have two blocks to go. I'm going right. <laughs> 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 
Yeah, that's why I used to pick her up at the door and, and deliver her because otherwise she would, you know, take the MBTA for an hour. Oh, amazing. I don't know what the name of the song was. Someone just wrote and asked. I don't know what the name of the song is. And what I would have to find is someone who is part of a temple that sings this song. And it was written by a poet who was imprisoned during World War II and Hitler kept him imprisoned and didn't kill him on purpose because he knew he would be creating a martyr of some kind. Mm -hmm. And he, you're saying Hirsch Gilk. It's possible. Is there a song which is sung in temple that is, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I would have to do some research and I know that I can get in touch with um, her daughter and she would know which song. Right. Right. We'll know. Um, and I can find that out. Um, but I, I wish I remember. But one of the women there was from a conservative, um, an Orthodox temple, and she said, she's not allowed to sing that song. Only the Jews are allowed to. And our director went, you think I'm going to tell an 86-year-old woman? <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> she's not Stella. <laughs> stepping on that woman's toes <laughs> the fact that he kept it in the show and it was one of the most moving things i mean anybody who was who did not know what it was about and would watch this and hear her singing and she had the most beautiful clear voice mm -hmm. but the fact that it just blew everybody out of the water everybody you know in that first rehearsal and the young kids were in tears going why? And it's just, you know, and then she told us all the story. And it was, it, it just blew everybody away. And she was an amazing woman, just an amazing yeah. woman. And taking that tradition, bringing it to folk dancing, and as you said, telling you the stories, and going to schools and telling these things, sharing her history was just so amazing for me. And she was such an inspiration in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Just an, an a total inspiration. Mm -hmm. There was a picture of her dancing out in the street, wrapped in winter clothes. Well, everybody around her was dressed up in summer. But they were walking down the street in Burlington, and somebody had music playing out the door. Mm -hmm. And she just started... <laughs> yeah, really? <laughs> by and videotaping her and they had her on the news because she mm -hmm. made it one block in about 45 minutes dancing the whole time she mm -hmm. just never stopped dancing and she had a stick and she was just <laughs> rotating around and, and it was just amazing amazing woman i will find stella's song and the title and should i get in touch with you paul would you please write me an email mm -hmm. And I will get in touch with Stella's daughter and find out. So send me an email to remind me because I speak in this and I think the same way. Right. So the email address is A T A Y for Taylor and then dance. So A T A Dance at, at Gmail. Correct. Um, while I have your all attention, I think that this was such a fascinating addendum to the interview. Um, I'm going to ask the people at Stockton if they'd like to include this as an addendum for the Stockton package and post it there. But I would, I would need to have all of your permission to do that because our faces are on there. So if anybody, I, I know it's a little bit uncertain to say I don't, you know, or there might be some hesitancy to say, well, you know, I don't think I want my, my visage on there. So please privately add a chat to me to say, I would prefer that you don't and I'll give you another minute or so to do that. And if, if nobody says no, and I think I really think a lot of people would be interested in all these stories and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, I'd love for them to do that. It, it's unlikely, I think, that they will do it because this is not really part of Stockton, but <laughs> it's Andy Taylor and it's a follow-on. So it is part of Stockton, I think, in terms of the heritage of folk dance and, and uh, the, the connections of your family and everything, all the different stories with folk dance and trying to draw college students in. I mean, all the wisdom that you experienced, that you, uh, that you, uh, that you espouse today. Thank um, so I will ask them, we'll see what happens. But uh, by all means, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna pressure anybody 
if anybody has a reservation, then we won't do that. So let me know um, and just do a private chat so no one else will will see it. And I don't, I don't, I won't mind at all if you say no. But anyway, Andy, absolutely awesome, absolutely awesome. Yeah. Um, I, you know, you have covered so many different topics, and it's so wonderful to have a little tiny little camera inside your brain and to watch what watch what happens inside your brain you know inside my brain is very confusing you don't want to be there <laughs> we have we it's have in a stream you don't want to see what happens inside my brain it's just <laughs> andy will you have your ice cream break after this i know on tuesday nights you guys always have your ice cream after the fountain dance i actually haven't had dinner yet so i'm gonna go down and have dinner first. Oh. good idea <laughs> Let's not keep her away from dinner. We don't want her to starve. So from, this is all, from all of us, oh, so go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I, I Thank you. saying and talking. Wonderful. <laughs> you and I are gonna talk about Stella sometime. We'll do. <laughs> Sally? Yes. I love you, darling. Love you. <laughs> Murray and Randy, thank you again for inviting me. I totally appreciate this. And Roberta, hope to see you Tuesday, and maybe you too, Lisa, possibly. You know, whenever. I hope. And Regina, good to see you again. Yes. Also nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Bye. See you. Bye now. Bye. 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 Okay, let's all wave goodbye. That'll be the ending. That'll be the end of the video. Okay. Bye.